Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, it's such a pleasure to welcome you all to the first in a series of salons, uh, a set of conversations that we'll be holding this semester with our global hub partners from around the world. In the spring um, of, of this year, we've started what we're calling the Global Hub Initiative by creating strategic partnerships with top universities and peers around the world. So we have a set of those on the call today, and we'll be talking about an important topic. Um, what will the city look like in the future? What is a sustainable city? And what is a socially just city? Who's included and how? These are questions of global relevance, of course, and they really can only be answered if you approach the question from multiple perspectives, from the grounded location of different places and also through different disciplines and lenses. So we're pleased to have many colleagues here from our important Global Hub partner universities. We don't have very much time this morning, so the talks will be quite quick, and I'll just hand it over to Rachel Riedel, who's the director of Cornell University's Mario Ainaudi Center for International Studies. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you to all of our panelists for being here to help us start this conversation and all of our audience members for listening in. I also want to invite our audience members to share your questions, your ideas, your responses in the Q&A function. We'll use those after we've gone through all of the introductions in order to continue the conversation and allow for responses to the panelists. Um, we will use these questions, um, the conversation itself as a springboard for the next steps of collaboration and, and really look forward to launching this today with all of you. So with that, I will be very brief because we want to move on to our experts gathered from the universities across the globe. And we're so thankful to you all to be here. Um, and we will start with Victoria Beard from Cornell University. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna share screen quickly. Can everyone see my screen and hear me? Awesome. Yep. So I'm Victoria Beard. I'm a professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell in the College of Architecture, Art and Planning. And I'm the inaugural director of the Center for Cities that's being started in my college and a fellow at the World Resources Institute in Washington, DC. These are the types of cities. And so I'm gonna follow the outline that we were given, talk a bit about my own work and then talk a bit about cities at Cornell and then try to engage this, uh, the intellectual thought challenge, I guess. The types of cities that I've always been interested in and have made me feel passionate about my work are cities that look like this, informal cities with a lot of self-built uh, human settlements. And indeed, these are the cities of the future, right? We know that, or we all keep reading that 2.5 billion people are moving to cities in the next 30 years, and most of them will be moving in Asia and Africa. And I've been interested in the impact that this type of urbanization has on households. And more recently, very interested in how they have access to core services, particularly water and sanitation in these types of cities. So I was involved in a study, and this is again, kind of referring to my own work that happened in five cities in Africa, five cities in South Asia, and five cities in Latin America that looked at equitable access to water and sanitation services. And we found that in these cities, only 58% of households had access to piped water to their dwelling. In 12 out of these 15 cities, water was intermittent or discontinuous. And this forced households to self-provide. And so this is a big issue in my work. They self-provide these services, and this often affects quality as well as paying much higher price. And they self-provide at both ends of the income spectrum, not just poor households, but also very wealthy households self-provide their own services in this context. And in these cities, 62% of human waste is not safely treated. So now kind of changing gears and talking about uh, urbanization or the future of cities at Cornell more broadly, AAP is very excited to start a new center for cities in our college. The idea is that this will bring together the three departments in my college and connect us to institutes like the Anaudi Center, the Atkinson Center, Cornell Tech, uh, all of these actors on campus that are interested in the future of cities and become a platform for bringing us together interdisciplinary and also engaging outside Cornell. We'll do this through initiatives, supporting faculty and students in their research and engaged learning. 
We have three initiatives. I'll just go through these really quickly. One on climate adaptation, where we work with Slum Dwellers International in Makuru, Nairobi. One on progressive cities that's uh, focused on the south side of Chicago and uh, regenerative urbanism, working with Sweetwater Foundation and a, alumni of our program. And then also this third initiative on the first ever global survey of city leaders engaging a thousand cities around the world in 165 countries. We've translated our instrument into 23 different languages and we're working with UN Habitat, SDI, UCLG, Mayor's Migration Council, and ECLAE. Now for the thought experiment and trying to keep it in the four minutes here. Um, as, as kind of Wendy said in her introduction, anyone interested in the future of cities knows that we have to engage with sustainability and issues of equity. I don't think this is completely captured in this phrase of environmental justice. I think there's actually an important tension between these two concepts that needs to be dealt with. And that is going to involve, and so this is kind of just maybe uh, not an incoherent list of what I'm thinking about as a research agenda. It's going to involve politics, engaging with the tension, again, between public and private interests, coalitions, collective action. And I think very importantly, um, as I talked Wendy out, out of naming the salon Smart Cities, I think there's a very important tension between technology and innovation. And so much hope is put on technology, but really I think we need to think more about innovation, some of which involves technology, but some of which doesn't, just out of the box thinking. And because I'm in city planning, I'm very concerned with engaged research and the transfer of knowledge to action. Thank you. That is wonderful, Victoria. Thank you. And well on time. Love the ideas that you've launched us off with today. Thank you. Our second speaker will be Dr. Suti Anansuk Somsi from Chulalcorn University. Thank you for being here. Hi, a greeting from Bangkok. But first of all, let me uh, share my screen first. Okay, so uh, greeting from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, first of all, as a Cornell alumnus, I'm so grateful to join this event. My name is Suthi Anand Suksomsi from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Faculty of Architecture at Chulalongkorn University. And I am also the head of the Center of Excellence in Regional Urban and Built Environmental Analytics at Chulalongkorn University. My research interests are on the issues related to urban economics, regional and urban development, complex system, and geoinformatics. And my research involves the future of cities in many aspects. Uh, my current research project, uh, titled Sharing Economy for Urban Sustainability, studies how socioeconomic activities based on the concept of sharing economy, namely food delivery service, chair accommodation, chair mobility, and public space affect the dynamics of Bangkok and its sustainable development. This project is a collaboration between Chulalongkorn University and many international universities. And one of uh, many interesting findings from this project is the impact of food delivery services on people's behavior in the city. As you know, in the past, a restaurant needed to be in a good location to attract customers. Today, however, customers can look for restaurants anywhere. Now, the important thing for restaurants is to have a good presence on the internet or digital platform to be found. Moreover, with the rise of food delivery services, the behaviors of customers and restaurant owners in many cities have changed rapidly, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Food delivery services have been the main selling channel for many restaurants. This phenomenon may indicate some changes in the interplay between range and threshold in the central place theory in urban economics. And in addition to uh, for sharing economy research projects, one of my doctoral students is working on the roles of co-working spaces in the working spaces in Bangkok. And you know, during the COVID pandemic, many people work from home instead of commuting to work at their offices in the city center. Some people choose to work in a co-working space in their suburban neighborhoods because their presence may not be suitable for working from home. 
not only the changes on the employee side, but also some employers have decided to change work policies by providing alternative work arrangement, reducing uh, permanent office spaces and renting temporary spaces in a co-working space. This current situation provides us unique insight into how well work from home and co-working spaces work. And the policy on working spaces may play a vital role in reshaping the structure of our future city. This phenomenon may indicate some changes in the bid rent theory proposed by Ricardo in 1809, Von Tunen in 1826, and Alonso in 1964. This has been one of the pillars of urban economics and urban planning. So uh, my further studies related to uh, future cities will explore the impact of digital on city. The empirical evidence from research can inform us about the validity of some classic urban econo economic theories and concepts that may change the direction of our future cities. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, next, we will move to Dr. Jaideep Chatterjee from Jindal Global University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this series. Um, feels good to connect with the center again. The last time was 22 years ago when I think I got my first grant as a doctoral student to go and do some initial field work in India. Um, now, uh, even today, many in many ways, my work stems from those moments of you know, field work. While then I focused on questions of how architects and designers understand their professional identities, their professional organizations, and their own expertise. Uh, my work today is much more concerned with the intellectual grounds uh, that ground architecture, design, and the allied disciplines of physical planning or civil engineering. Uh, specifically, I'm interested in how a particular idea of time, temporality, which while never acknowledged within these disciplines, is in fact a central organizing principle of these disciplines. And my recent work uh, sort of especially focuses on the various forms of representation, um, whether these be technical drawings, presentation drawings, digital modeling, analog modeling, animations, the flow of material and work, which simultaneously, I think, disseminates, um, propagates, sometimes contests this notion of time, of temporality. Now, uh, the research group that I'm representing today, and we are a you know, very uh, re new group, uh, the, the Jindal School of Art and Architecture, of which I am uh, the executive dean, we are a new school, we are just pulling all of this together, um, also broadly coalesces around this uh, idea of time. And, and so what we are especially interested in is in the term future, in the topic of today's discussion, future cities. Um, now this term future has had a long history in the discipline of architecture, design, physical planning. It, is, it has been kind of a linchpin uh, and in the last 200 years or so, giving a vision of the future has been uh, sort of the bedrock of these disciplines. We see this right from the 19th century onwards. Uh, in the mid 20th century, you know, uh, we, uh, we see the Lasseras Declaration, then the International Congress of Modern Architecture, you know, where a template for cities and pedagogy for architects, designers, and planners has developed. Um, India, you know, in, in my own work, I've shown how we were a special beneficiary of this, you know, right from the master plans of 1960s, um, you know, to the various in, e educational institutions, uh, efforts towards the legalization of the profession. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, indeed, uh, the future, this, this, the stake to, to providing a vision for the future has been central. Now, what is also noteworthy is that this future was not only central to architecture and engineering in all of these disciplines, but as much of the recent work has shown us, was central to discourses of nationalism, history, development, all of that, um, too. But then this, is a, uh, this idea of the future is actually a very problematic one. And, and, and as many of the post-colonial uh, writers have shown us, that this uh, idea of the future is always, always refers to a future that will be. And not only is this a future then in that sense, which is permanently deferred, but also as a future, which is since it will be a kind of a history in this sense, right? And as such, this future history is actually fraught with unequal relations of power 
which subsume multiple ontologies in its wake, right? Producing a singular ontology, whether this be of capital, the nation, development, et cetera, et cetera, which ultimately designates the global South and its built environments to what is called the waiting room of history as not yet there, or as I like to say, perhaps will never be uh, there yet. So that's what we are kind of as a group interested in, again, to take a leaf from recent work, is to not only engage with this, the future um, that will be, but also simultaneously with what other scholars have called futures that always and already are. Futures that necessarily work with multiple ontologies, temporalities in the production, sustenance and contestations of the built environment. And here to go to onto the thought experiment, uh, just I'll just take a minute, uh, three questions, three things that we want to look at, right? We want to look at that how are these big projects, which are there, these big vision projects, right? How are the, the goods, the flow, the money, the knowledge shape these projects on the ground? And what kind of unruly, unsustainable environments do these projects leave behind, right? Um, second area we are very interested in is looking at alternative ways of making which actually disrupt this kind of big vision project. So alternative technologies, alternative, um, uh, you know, on ground using local things and, and all of that. And finally, number three, and I'll just quickly close here, is the is the is pedagogy itself for both design, architecture, civil engineering, planning schools, where we want to kind of rework moments, I think, which are constantly perpetuating this kind of a vision of the future, right? So I'm just going to stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really fascinating. As, as a student of the politics of time, I, I find that incredibly rich. Wonderful. To our next panelist and host, um, Dr. Gilbert Siame from the University of Zambia. Thank you. Gilbert, we can't hear you yet. Great. Everybody get me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm based in Zambia, and I'm going to speak from the positionality of uh, Zambia. Uh, Southern Africa and a bit of um, Africa and the global south. So largely my work engages with the questions and issues affecting global south cities and particularly Southern Africa. And one major issue here is the projected and expected growth of uh, African cities and also cities in, in, in Asia as well as South America. Uh, the, the question is the nature and the quality of growth and the quality of the population and the living conditions of the people and the need to transition, to rethink. Growth is happening very rapidly, I can see in the picture, and this is phenomenal in many places. Um, cities are growing way above 4 5%. Lusaka, for example, where I live, is growing about 4.9%. And the city's, city government is far from catching up with the needs of the citizens. Now, the nature of the growth is what is raising questions, and that's what drives my work. Uh, the picture on your left is a picture that I got from Kampala in Uganda, huge informalities. And then on the right is a, is a settlement in Lusaka, um, uh, huge informalities affected by lack of infrastructure, climate change issues manifesting in droughts and floods. Just in summary, we are looking at 60 to 70 percent of Africans living in this type of environment, with Lusaka specifically having 72 percent. But our, what are we seeing on uh, is the effort and direction of government. We are seeing uh, investment in uh, ultra modern kind of city design and investments. This is a settlement planned out of the city, 30 kilometers out of the city of Lusaka. It's going to be quite city, really for the upper middle class, and very few can manage. This is what we are seeing here as a dominant reality. And then this is not just in Zambia, much of Africa is experiencing this. Some of you might have seen the Eco Atlantic city in Lagos, a place I've been about the privilege to visit. You see similar stuff uh, in Kenya and many other parts uh, of Africa. So there's a disparity here between 
what is dominant really reality on the ground versus where government money and private sector money is going and how the ordinary person uh, on the street and in formal settlements is struggling to survive barely on a daily basis. And so in terms of the work that I have been doing and the, the structuring, structuring questions that uh, we have at the university is, the, is we, we are, at the center that I lead, we have these four questions that uh, uh, guide our proposals and our work and our teaching. The first one is that given the complexity and dynamism of urban systems, how can urban research be undertaken for urban actors to effectively work in the third space. In short, we ask how can transdisciplinary research, urban research be undertaken to facilitate urban transitions and transformations. Here we have projects on transdisciplinarity in practice. We have projects on African, um, on future African resilience uh, in cities and lands. We have projects on interactions uh, between in urban infrastructure and urban flooding and there are a number of other projects. The other uh, innovation and project that is running that we have uh, is we ask questions. Uh, what might universities do differently to produce relevant knowledge and graduates for sustainable urban futures? Here we emphasize in our work on innovative pedagogy and we have a master's program, which is Master of Science in Special Planning that depends on teaching based on lived experience, lived reality in the communities with a lot of collaboration with Islam Dras International, ICLE and several others we teach students who are going to make sense in the context of our dominant urban reality to facilitate transitions that are fair, just, and inclusive. Uh, and, and, and research at the center speaks greatly to this theme of knowledge and graduates that make sense now and tomorrow. Then the third question that structure, structures our work is, is who is the gatekeeper uh, for rethinking future cities and urban change? and whose knowledge and innovation counts, and how might we harness this for a better urban tomorrow. Here, we focus on institutions at various levels, from the community to the central government, including the private sector. Who is doing what? Why are we seeing investment going this direction when the dominant reality is this one? How can we then harness this chaos to, to, to sort of begin to restructure its direction and promote collaboration and thinking together? How can we make institutions work better? The other part, and we have a project there. The other question that we have is, uh, we ask in the era of post politics and post truth, how might, an, uh, how might an emphasis on soft power skills, such as professional values and integrity building among urban uh, scholars support an inclusive, just and efficient future uh, urban systems? Here we look at issues like corruption in urban development, uh, the decisions on where infrastructure goes, who makes what decision and how are professionals positioned in that space, sometimes going away from political corruption to professional corruption. And we have a project here that was funded by, that is funded by the British government, seriously studying corruption, urban decision making, soft power negotiations and things like that. The last structure and question that we have we ask how might South-South and North-South research and teaching partnerships promote translocal learning and innovation and support global citizenship. Here we zoom out from the city to a little bit of region and we have corporations and uh, partnerships uh, with the uh, universities in the US. Uh, specifically, uh, we are partnering with Wisconsin and we work on a program called EPIC. Uh, that is Education Partnerships for Innovations in Communities and I sit on that board. This is a large program that touches across Africa. And it's, it was an initial headquartered at the center which I ran. So we've got a number of uh, innovations, but really these are the questions that we ask. And in each of these questions, we have a program, we have a research project uh, with partners across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Siame. Really wonderful to hear about your work and ongoing projects. <clears throat> Next, we'll have Dr. Max Zay from Cornell University. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Max Zay. I'm a professor of mechanical uh, engineering. I'm also a faculty, faculty director at the Cornell Atkinson for sustainability. Uh, if, I, if I want to have one wish uh, for what the future city would be like, uh, I'm, I'm hoping those are equitable ones. Right? So I will focus on my talk, my four minutes on my perspective of the challenges in the 
uh, environmental health in inequality uh, in terms of the air quality, uh, but also talk about the opportunity from the Atkinson, Cornell Atkinson uh, broadly. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm glad I'm, uh, I, uh, I spoke after uh, Dr. Samir, right? So uh, from Zambia, and uh, uh, there's a number, a large number of uh, health, uh, health studies on the global uh, health burden, and this is just one of them, right? So showing the reduction on the birth weight uh, for for babies, right, attributable to total uh, air pollution, and uh, what what make it very striking, as you can tell, is the uh, the largest health burden, right? So occur in the sub-Sahara uh, Africa, right? And uh, from another perspective, uh, this is a report showing the uh, availability of air quality data globally, right? Uh, what make it even more striking is the in Africa, in general, that's the where you find the most scarce uh, availability of air quality, right? I think that just to show a contrast, right? So you had the largest health burden uh, attributable to air pollution, but at the same time, uh, we just don't have a lot, you know, uh, much data available. Right? So uh, this is the, in from the global um, perspective. And uh, if we looking uh, in the US, uh, this is a satellite, uh, satellite views of the Hunts, um, Point produce market uh, in New York City, which supply about over 40% of the vegetables uh, in the city. Um, uh, when we first, you know, when I first look at the photo, I couldn't tell what exactly all the boxes are, right? So it's a turn out that all diesel engines are running elderly, uh, you know, running, right, to supply cooling uh, to the market to maintain the temperature of the vegetable in the market, right? So because the lack of uh, cooling capacity in the market, so they have to use all those engines, you know, use uh, those diesel engines, uh, provide additional cooling, right? So as you can tell, we are looking at the th uh, literally thousands of running diesel engine in this very concentrated area. And uh, so there's a consequence, right? So when we consume uh, vegetables, right? So there's a consequent environmental consequences. Uh, associated with them. And uh, another perspective is uh, uh, this is a school uh, in California uh, located uh, about 100 meters uh, from a highway, from a very busy intersection uh, with traffic over uh, 300,000 vehicles per day, right? And uh, so it's not just occurred in uh, California, actually, in almost every state, you can find those schools located very close to the uh, beta heavy intersection. And they happen to be, uh, you know, come from the family of low income or the minorities. Um, so uh, hopefully this is my, uh, my, uh, my uh, proposal, right, to the, to the Global Hub uh, to address those inequality issues and uh, so uh, I do want to uh, mention here that Cornell Atkinson uh, provide those opportunities uh, because the, uh, uh, it's a impact driven institution, right? And uh, over 400 uh, faculty fellows of core campus, and uh, it had been perceived as a hub of uh, sustainable research uh, on campus. It drives uh, climate, energy, food, and health. And uh, I think most importantly, this is my last slide. Um, so the Cornell Atkinson already had this international connections, right? So uh, having, so over a year had been funded the project for Cornell researcher to work with international international partners, and we do have, you know, I uh, we do have, uh, uh, I think, you know, working together, right? Uh, hopefully, we'll uh, be able to address those uh, uh, environmental health uh, equality across the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. Wonderful. Um, next, we'll move to Dr. Jonathan Guillermo at the University of San Francisco de Quito. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. So, greetings from, uh, from Quito, Ecuador. Um, I'm very happy, very uh, thrilled to be here, and I'm going to Need be on a more of a 
parallel topic, parallel in the sense that it's rarely addressed when we discuss um, when we discuss um, urbanization and future cities. The topic of aging, one that I find uh, tremendously interesting. Of course, well, it's, it's uh, the field I, I, I'm in, and um, just because it's a topic that is rarely addressed, I'd, long, I'd like to, to put some five big questions that are related to aging. In the future of cities, we see usually cities as the young, as the youth, as the future, but it's also a, a, a space for aging. So maybe the first question is about socialization and intergenerational uh, socialization in future cities. We're not talking just uh, Europe and North America, we're actually talking the whole world uh, in terms of this problematic following um, increased mobility of people and the uh, a decline of the single house uh, model uh, for intergenerational housing. So uh, a very important point that I think is uh, worth uh, being discussed. Um, end of life and death in future cities. It's also one that is rarely addressed, which I think is a fundamental one. Uh, how do we include this moment of life as part of the future uh, city? demographic transition and decline in future cities. But what I mean by decline here is the demographic decline. We're talking of cities that are increasing in size is going to be mainly the case, but we are also going to see cities that are going to decline in numbers of people living there. How do we address the future cities that shrinks? Um, and of course, usually associated with a strong aging of its population. Housing mobility and loss of uh, autonomy uh, in future cities. It's not just about mobility. How do we address the, the life of those who are more uh, vulnerable, like older adults, in those future cities? Uh, again, with the, the, the attraction we may have towards cities that are seen as the young. And then maybe one last big question here. Um, the global south, uh, as it is the case in Ecuador, are, uh, is, is a region, a very immense region of the world, where most likely growing older is going to happen before uh, the region grows richer. This is a standard uh, or very common expression in the field of gerontology. How do we address the aging of a country when its occurrence is happening before the country uh, becomes rich? And that's a fundamental, a fundamental and big question that the global north have, that does, uh, did not have to face. So a few goals that we are uh, addressing uh, currently at, at the university, uh, the constitution of an evidence-based um, um, system around an age-friendly Ecuador, uh, around three main projects at the moment, and they are uh, growing, uh, rapidly. The first one, the one that is most advanced, the extended uh, caregiver training. How do we train family, but also professional caregivers within that space of uh, new and future urban spaces where family caregivers are not necessarily the ones that are present there. Um, Age-friendly cities network, also the city of the future is seen as an immense city, but it's also a network of mid-sized and small cities. How do we address the topic of um, expertise in the field of aging for mid-sized and small cities. So we're working towards building a network of cities in this regard. And uh, more specifically in the Galapagos Archipelago, the, uh, the, the, the project of an integrated gerontological campus for older adults in this context of an urbanizing uh, Galapagos. Be beyond the field of aging, uh, the one of um, the one of uh, the one health approach, uh, not just uh, human health, but also uh, animal health, environmental health, um, uh, to towards uh, a, a larger. That's my my four minutes. I'm going to stop uh, there. So just a few things that we can offer at uh, Universidad San Francisco de Quito. I'm not going to go much further. Just to maybe concluding on uh, futures research and. It's also about methodology and how the Delphi methodology can be one that is uh, quite useful into developing um, uh, approaches that include the voice of the people as well as the experts. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been uh, lovely exchanging and I look forward to questions and conversations. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Guillermo. Well, there we have already I'm seeing so many connections in terms of time across space and scales and within a, a single lifespan. Um, next, we have Dr. Isaac Arthur from the University of Ghana, Legon. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Hello, thank you. And um, hello to everybody. Um, as I've been introduced, I belong to uh, the University of Ghana uh, as a lecturer in uh, human geography and also the director for the Center for Urban Management Studies. Um, uh, reflecting on the future cities um, within the context of my research, um, a number of uh, themes or things uh, come into play. That is the issues of uh, exclusion within the urban space, uh, the proper use of space, uh, and then the issue of congestions. And the congestions can be seen within the context of human and uh, vehicular traffic congestions. And this is a, a very pronounced uh, uh, issue, especially in, in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa generally. And um, a lot of times we think about how we want to address some of these issues. And, um, but looking at the African phenomenon, I think that there are a lot of uh, ideas that have been uh, put across, you know, in terms of how to address these issues and with respect to how the future city should look like. And um, I think that one of the, or oh, two, uh, one of the key things that uh, one has to take into consideration is about implementation because the ideas are there, but the problem within uh, most African cities is about implementation. So the question is, how do you implement these ideas to make uh, cities more livable, uh, make um, future cities attractive or easy to uh, design uh, cities in the future? So these are some of the things that, uh, that needs to be looked at. And then secondly, is about education. We talk about the fact that uh, children are the future uh, leaders. So the future actually belongs to the, uh, the children and yet unborn. So what are we doing in terms of educating uh, younger ones uh, to understand the environment very well and also be able to develop ideas which can be used in the design of uh, uh, design and development of uh, the future cities. So these are some of the things that I sort of uh, try to understand uh, within my, um, my work. And then um, in terms of um, uh, connections, um, um, I belong to a number of um, um, networks, uh, the uh, new African university networks, um, the Sustainable um, Cities Partnership. And basically all we're doing here is to promote sustainable uh, development in cities uh, in terms of uh, planning and uh, as well as development. Uh, so as the center director, I am looking forward that to partner with um, academics, um, practitioners, and to think through ways in which um, uh, the urban built environment uh, could be uh, improved or developed um, within the future cities uh, context. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur. Wonderful. Next, we will go to Dr. Nick Holloman, King's College of London. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, or morning, or evening, but afternoon here in, uh, in the UK. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's very interesting to hear these fascinating snapshots of things from around the world. Um, I, I joined King's College just, uh, just last month, actually, so I'll give you a, a, an overview of what we do in uh, CUSP, which is the Centre for Urban Science and Progress. Um, and I think we're slightly different from some of the speakers so far in that we're based in informatics, which is really computer science. So we're very technology driven. Um, and I think the things we'll be doing are very much around the technologies related to cities and how they're changing the way we think about cities. Um, so we're based here on this little map between the City of London and the Houses of Parliament, right in the centre of London. 
Um, and I'll come back to the map in a second. We're an international research collaboration. We have collaborators in New York. We have collaborators uh, in, in Singapore and Australia uh, and China as well. So we're quite quite linked in across the globe, but there are many places we're not represented in and it would be nice to uh, link to more of you. Um, the things we're focused on at the moment, very much a human machine teaming. How do we bring uh, the benefits of data science and AI to human work and human interests? And, um, and within that, within the context of, of uh, future cities and the urban environment, um, and how can we bring that then to serve the urban community? And that's a question I'll, I'll give you some examples of in a second. At the moment, as I said, we're, our vision is very much to combine technology and with novel research. And I'm going to mention the metaverse because although it's a somewhat of a cliche already, it's very much a thing that's driving our thinking. And how do we bring AR, VR, digital twins, blended working to the city to improve it? Um, my own background in industry, so I've got experience in, in, in delivering impact from research in, into the real world, and it's much harder than most academics think. And I was interested, I think the, the speaker from Ghana said similar things. Academic ideas and, and real ideas are, are not the same. I'll point to the picture on this slide before I move on to my last slide. Um, the red zone there is that it's a map of broadband connectivity in the UK. And the City of London, which is just on the right of that map, has the worst broadband connectivity for residents in the whole of England. Um, so you'd think the centre of a modern city would be a good place for that, but no, it's actually quite a bad place. And digital uh, inequalities are something we're very interested in. I'll just move on to one last slide. So CUSP itself is a process as much as a, as a centre, and we're very interested in how we bring together these three things. In, in a virtuous circle. How do we bring together research, teaching and impact? And I'll give you a brief example of each and then I'll stop. So in research, I'm very interested in visualization. I work with the Allen Institute, Alan Turing Institute in London, not the UK's Institute for Data Science and AI. And um, we're interested in visualization and we're interested in truthful representations of information. So we're doing global tests on visualization methods, a very scientific approach to understand what works across the globe. Um, and we'd be very interested in partners who want to host um, visualization uh, experiments with us because we're very interested in how do we represent information so that anyone in any country would understand it. Uh, we link into teaching, we have an urban informatics MSc and um, one of the projects there is to study how, we've got five students working on this right now, how using Zoom and Teams and other online collaborations changes the way decisions are made. Um, and, and if your connectivity is worse, does it make your decisions worse? What's the, what, what, are the, what are the variations there? And then finally, an impact. CUSP's got a long history of impact. Um, we work, for example, with the London Ambulance Service, modeling the way in which ambulances are delivered. We work with um, the National Portrait Gallery, modeling the way in which the people see portraits in the portrait gallery. Uh, and with local government, the Westminster Council, for example, in trying to predict things like future healthcare demands. So, okay, our arts, the CUSP and King's College London. And we're doing very, very, very interested in the digital future of cities, which means that I'm not so sure there's a physical future for everybody in cities and that some people may be able to move out of them. Okay, thank you for listening. Fantastic. I see that connections very much with the, the um, presentation by um, Dr. Anand Suksomsi as well in terms of co-working and digital um, connectivity as well. Thank you. So Dr. Next we'll have Dr. Anandita Banerjee from Cornell University. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, I will begin by saying that um, um, let me pick up Professor Holliman's uh, invocation of the metaverse as the newest best thing that comes from what I, in the Department of Literature, started by studying as the work that the works of imagination, the imaginative arts do in the world. And the metaverse, as you all know, is a concept that was, that came from uh, uh, Neil Stephenson's novel, Snow Crash, a science fiction novel from the mid or early 90s. And indeed, um, I figured that I will start with two quotes, is another science fiction giant who coined the term cyberspace, which in which we are now 
discussing global cities. And that happens to be William Gibson, who said way back in eight, uh, 1989, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And in each and every presentation today, I saw the attention that we are now being compelled to face. I would counter that for introducing my work by quoting uh, 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 Navajo uh, philosopher. Um, and as maybe many of you will know that the Diné lands in, in the Southwestern uh, US, um, the both you know, urban and rural areas as well as uh, their, their edges there is an edge effect there that is completely shaped by a uh, history of uh, uh, toxic pollutants, most uh, beginning with uranium and of course gold before that in the 19th century. So we are talking about imagining futures from waste, wastelands that have been wastelanded. This is for me very important because um, my work primarily um, that has brought me into really close contact and productive collaborations with students and scholars and colleagues of multiple generations at uh, the Atkinson Center um, here at Cornell, as well as the NLD Center that's hosting this meeting, as well as a number of units. Uh, a majority of my advisees right now are from architecture, city and regional planning, as well as landscape architecture in um, uh, uh, another uh, part of Cornell. Uh, how we work together, uh, how I got here where I don't work with humanists anymore practically is uh, my interest in knowing at uh, what kind, what work does imagination do in the world? Why is it important, right? And how, um, you know, uh, how to reconceive imagination, not as uh, lots of people think as a, well, starting from the Greek philosopher Plato as a mere weak reflection, right, of what is real and actual and urgent in the world, but to see how imagination works as an active force um, in the conceptualization, actualization. And I think it was um, uh, 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 Dr. Arthur who said implementation as well as Professor Siam, right? So the implementation, this, uh, so what role does the imagination play? And how can we transform these dialogues uh, between the humanities and the sciences and design and planning uh, uh, into a practice, a practice that is transdisciplinary at uh, dialogue-based development. And sometimes it means building stuff from the ground up, which for me is very fulfilling, um, uh, uh, to, to how to forge out paths of practice. Uh, my uh, interest is uh, derives from where science fiction uh, is being produced in uh, the span of my academic career. And those are extreme cities in the global East and South, namely Africa, America, uh, Africa, Latin America, uh, various parts of Asia, as well as indigenous Americas. So um, I would, I, I guess I will conclude by saying, so to me, looking at where these imaginations of the futures that are urgently needed because we can only have the ones that we can imagine, how these stories, how these, these, these flows between data and stories um, are, uh, are, are being generated right from global cities. Global cities, not just as apocalyptic landscapes that we must come in and save, but how global cities themselves are producing these visions and what we can do with them. Thank you. So rich, so wonderful. Thank you so much, Anandita, wonderful. Next, we'll move to Dr. Ho Kan Lo from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'd like to share some experience in making our campus smart and sustainable, which is implementation hands-on uh, things. There are a lot of good ideas that people have but when it comes to implement them on campus, it's a totally different story. I'm going to share that experience with you. Now, before that, I'd like to say something about, uh, I'm director of the Great Smart City Institute. Uh, we formed, we established that three years ago, great for five attributes. We would like future cities to work toward 
using technology, using consensus and big data and so on. I will elaborate more than simply saying green, resilient, empowering, adaptable, and transformative. We like to use technology and also understand the human behavior to drive toward these five attributes. So uh, let me simply turn to the experiment. So the university is very generous, gave the center 50 million over the last five, three years now uh, to look into how to transform our campus into a living lab. So we use a lot of crowdsourcing, look at what students and researchers and faculty and staff have, and then we have call for proposal, eventually implement that on campus. Now, one of the toughest things you can imagine when you implement something, it's about the campus operations, the FMO guy, the, in, the information uh, services people and so on. You want to work with them, but they don't want to work with you. So all the innovation somehow need a lot of push before they even listen. So that is a major story. We find implementation, people, institutions are critical in uh, bring out innovation uh, out in the real world. So I, if you ask me, I can say some more examples, but this is the idea. So some is very powerful. We know the grand challenges here. Some are more achievable, uh, like uh, how to make the building more efficient, how to do gray water recycling. What we try to do is bring them together so that we look at what we can do immediately so that we can learn, uh, create pathways for the future. So those are the long-term powerful goals and what we can do now, how we want to project to the future. And that turned out to be a very fruitful experiment in the last three years. Uh, so this is like uh, some of the sample projects. We have covered a lot of different areas, uh, you know, from water, mobility, energy, biodiversity, and so on. So we fund those projects, let them implement it on our campus. And then we build a digital twin, make it use for building management services, cut back on AC and so on. We do a, a AI camera, look at birds, look into a green biodiversity. Uh, is global warming affecting the migrate, migrant birds going through our campus or not? So look into various sorts of projects. Now, eventually, uh, we also look at the entire campus, put solar panels everywhere, every inch of our roof, and experiment. We find that with all this effort, we only save about 3% of our electricity consumption. To me, that was appalling, so little. So we have to do much more. If we were to go beyond using solar panel to solve our energy kind of problem in the future. So we learned a lot along the way. And then uh, uh, that should be my last slide. I welcome any partnership. If your campus is also have a living lab, I'd like to you know, learn from each other, maybe build some sort of alliance. So we learn what are the lessons learned behind. So you can find the website here. Uh, I think there are a lot of lessons learned in the last few years. This is the end of my third year of this project. We still have some money to look for the, a few more projects for the future. Uh, let me uh, stop here. Fantastic, Professor Honglo. Thank you so much, Lee. Also at Cornell University, I'm sure you're familiar with the Lab of Ornithology. We know some of their representatives are on this call right now. Uh, so great connections there, as well as our campus as a living laboratory um, for geothermal and the like. Next, last but not least, Dr. Roberto Ponce Lopez from Technolo Tecnologico de Monterrey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Let, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, can, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we don't yet oh. see the screen. Yes, I don't know what happened. Okay, I think it's working now. Sorry, este, so sorry, just, okay. Let me try again, this works, okay. Perfect, thank you. I don't know what's going on with my computer. It seems like I cannot share my screen, uh, but uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to go with my presentation. Sorry about that. 
We can uh, we can see your screen. Oh, you can see my screen. Okay, yo, now it's working. I think it's just like a lag in my. Okay, now it's working. Yeah. So, um, future series. I, I I I'm a researcher and professor at the School of Government in Technological Montreal, and I will talk to you about what we do on future cities uh, here in my research uh, lab. So, for Techno Montreal, cities are very important. It's on the vision for the 2030 and the 2050. There are three or four initiatives spread in different institutes and, and, and schools uh, across the university. And what I could say is uh, in Mexico in general, not only in my institution, when we talk about future cities, we immediately associate it with smart cities. I mean, it's not my case, but uh, the situation here down here in Mexico is like um, smart cities has become a sort of buzzword where uh, kind of policymakers and uh, even my colleagues and of course the private sector as well, they they tend to have this uh, uncritical faith on how technology will solve the, the most challenging problems that we have in our cities. And what we try to do and I try to do in my research lab is to content this vision on, on technology and, 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 and the smart cities in Mexico. We try to do uh, high quality research data driven based on quantitative methods on 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 different issues of of the cities um this is the main project that i lead now it's uh, it's called uh, the cost of urban sprawl in monterey uh, this is the, the map of the city of monterey what has happened over the past 30 years is that that the population increased by two times but the urban area increased by three times um, so in consequence, the city lost like 40% of its population. This is happening not only in Monterey, but this is happening, this is the model of growth that we have in our Mexican cities. We've studied this pattern and it's very common. What is happening is that we are depopulating the central areas of the city and all the growth is happening in the suburbs, in the outskirts. So everyone is migrating to the suburbs, the low income families, the middle income families, and also the high income families. And so we, we try to address this, we call them with urban problems. Um, for instance, housing affordability in central areas. So this is one of the main uh, causes of urban sprawl in Mexican cities. We, we have, uh, it's very hard to renew uh, central urban areas. Uh, also the central areas become highly commercial. So the cost of land is expensive and, and, and it comes daunting to have like a proper supply of affordable housing in those areas. Also lack of transportation infrastructure. Uh, cities are highly segregated. Crime, also crime kind of intervenes with uh, uh, urban sprawl. Uh, there's been changes in the urban form as well. So the city grows, what, what are the implications for the morphology of the city? And, uh, and we try to work on future scenarios of growth. This is like the main project. This is an example of what we're doing on to characterizing urban form. These are the main concentrations, uh, the spots of uh, the areas with the highest concentration of jobs in the city. So we, we propose like different data-driven approaches to characterize the urban form in Mexican cities. And we work a lot with social housing. This is the, the pattern that we have in our cities. So social housing is like this, this model of industrialized housing that is located in inaccessible areas the outskirts in the periphery of the city and in the functional area we have this this type of residential segregation no? or cities is highly segregated uh, we have social housing but we, we tend to expel the low, lower income families who live in the outskirts but they don't have access to jobs they don't have access to transportation and as a consequence around like 10 percent of this uh, type of supply of industrialized housing is empty they are abandoned. And so, so this is what we have here in Mexico, a model of urbanization. We try to do a lot in, in the academia uh, on this trying to research. Much research is, is, is needed um, on Mexican cities. Uh, we have lots of data as well. And what, what is the reality down here is that the uh, Traditionally, like urban planning has been very tied to, to the field of architecture. So we're like a group of economists, sociologists, political scientists, uh, uh, computer scientists trying to come up with 
a, a fresh and, and a newer vision to approach uh, the future of the cities in Mexico. And thank you. Thank you so much. That is absolutely wonderful. I know we're at the, the top of our, the hour for our salon, but I just want to thank all of the panelists for these incredible presentations. And um, if people have to hop off, I, I know that's, that's um, totally understandable. Uh, but I do just want to pose uh, three quick questions that um, that unites and, and build on the feedback that some um, of our audience members have shared in the Q&A. And the first is really to unite the connections that so many of you have drawn between, and the tension that Victoria uh, raised for us in her opening comments as well, between the possibility of technology and innovation and the imaginations, as Anandita uh, referenced as well, between present and future, um, um, and, and Dr. Chatterjee also uh, brought this to, to light in terms of what types of technology and innovation create futures and presents um, for whom and what types with what consequences and on what time scales with what disruptions. Um, and so how do we think these imaginations and possibilities, where do they emerge from? Um, and through what processes. So I think that's one kind of overarching question that brings together a lot of what uh, many of you have, have spoken about through various um, lenses. Another question from Ian Underwood at the University of Edinburgh, thank you for the question, was directly to Dr. Guillermo, which asked if you could comment on extending aging to other dimensions of inclusion, mobility, finance, etc. And from Ray Crabe, who's a professor uh, of history at Cornell, I'm interested in hearing more about free or private cities, charter cities, um, and the degree to which those are understood to be the harbingers of urban futures. So um, we'll just take a few minutes. If anyone has something they want to react to, raise your hand amongst our panelists and, um, and, and respond to what each other has said uh, and some of these questions that have been posed. We'll just take a very few minutes to, to extend the conversation. Dr. Chatterjee? Um, yeah, this is not so much a question, but just a kind of a thing that came to my mind when Max was talking about the air quality. You know, we were, we, we did one of these projects with air quality in, in, in New Delhi. And what was interesting is, you know, Delhi has been, you know, it, at one point of time, it wanted to import these massive air purifiers for the city, which they were planning to put in the middle of the city in a bid to change uh, the entire uh, air quality of Delhi. Um, and and, and if, if that was one big sort of technology, the other thing that's always happened is that, you know, air quality purifiers that, that exist, and most of them are placed at government um, stations uh, in India and many parts of the country, they're all placed in these wonderful compounds which have the most trees, right? So the kind of data you actually get from them is very, uh, 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 you know, different from what is happening just outside the gate. So one of the things that, you know, this disruptive thing that we were doing is we were, um, we were creating these very low cost uh, technologies, for, uh, you know, and, and easily available technologies with which people could just make an air purifier. And as a result, what happened is, um, well, A, we in Sort of point collection of data, we started getting a mesh network idea of air quality in and, a, and a much more finely granulated. But what the, the, the other thing that I sort of want to bring to Max's notice was this, that what happens now is that every time that the, that the government comes out with the data on air pollution, we have all these people who we distributed these uh, little uh, things to, they go right in front of the government and say, ha ha, that's not true. Look at what's happening here. So there's a very interesting politics that's ha that's developing because of this air quality mon uh, uh, monitor technology, you know, and uh, that's what, what I meant by kind of disruption and, and something like that happening. So it, it, I'd, I'd be interested to hear uh, more about what the Atkinson Center has been doing in terms of, of uh, you know, air quality. How has it been tracing? Is it the older way of, of point collection? How, how has that been working? That's just a question uh, that came to my mind. Um. Yeah, and you know, this is a really uh, interesting question. I saw also Victoria also post some link here on the chat. Um, my, you know, I think my quick response here is that, um, uh, so there's always uh, technology 
but also there's the engagement piece, right? So um, how you turn uh, how you turn technology so technological technological solution into actions? Uh, I think that's the you know what I see. This is always the 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 most challenging last mile uh, challenge is the action part. Um, we can we can collect data. Uh, there's a different way to collect data. There's a different technology to mapping the air pollution level. Uh, but I think what's really, you know, this is where the impact come from is the how we can lead, you know, all those lead to actions, right? So I think this is where I think the, a, you know, it's it gonna be a multidisciplinary uh, approach to, uh, to it. You know, in some way that's what uh, Cornell Atkinson uh, is known for is the when you try to solving a problem, you know, actually solving a problem or have an impact, it got to be a multidisciplinary uh, team addressing it. Right? I mean, that's my short one, but on, you know, maybe in the offline uh, discussion. This is absolutely just the beginning. We look forward to the, the continued discussion. Anandita. Yes, <laughs> all of these buttons. Um, I uh, was wondering, um, uh, this is also a very general question, but one that is tied to an, another uh, core, uh, an ongoing and, and actually exploding interest of mine, but that also just happens to be uh, the current uh, 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 global grand challenge topic, which is migration. I myself was a migrant into the city. Um, and uh, what I would really love to know more and to work more on, and that seems to be uh, a big concern for our next generations at Cornell, is um, the assumed default binary between the rural and uh, the urban, or uh, we all know like the suburbanization discourse because of US history is now kind of a fact. And you can take it and apply it. For instance, I was fascinated by Professor Ponce Lopez. This is, um, uh, you know, basically charting the exact same thing as we hear happening in American cities, for example. So this is kind of a well-known historical fact now. Where do we go from there in rethinking the rural urban suburban triangulation, I mean, it's not that neat, right? Jindal, for example, when I was an undergraduate at JNU, was scrubland. <laughs> it was the rural. In my memory, I cannot, I've not been to your campus, Professor Chatterjee, but it is very difficult for me to imagine a university there. As of course, JNU was before it was built, right, on rural land. So, I mean, of all cities that I have, I have studied in any depth have these edges. What do we do with the edge? Absolutely, a fantastic question. And we think about um, mobility between rural, urban, and everything in between and what that looks like. Um, in order to close us, I'm going to pass it over to Wendy Wolford, our Vice Provost for International Affairs, and just to thank all of the panelists one more time and to say that this, again, is just the beginning of the conversation. We'll continue to discuss next steps. Wendy. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to all of our panelists. That was fantastic. Really interesting to hear the work you're doing, the work that's going on in the universities, um, and to think about the connections. These sort of discussions of aspiration and imagination, operation, the way you bring all of these together in lived landscapes, I think is fascinating. And um, I forget who it was, maybe Gilbert, who talked about different ontologies, different ways of living in what is the same urban space, right? So thinking about multiple audiences um, from all of your perspectives. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, we'll follow up and I hope to see more collaborations come out of this. Take care.